All right. Hi. Hello, everyone. I am Sightless Combat. For those of you who don't know who I am, I am a, an accessibility advocate from the UK, and I primarily focus on the accessibility of mainstream video games. Now, I've been playing mainstream video games for a number of years, partly to engage in the same social experiences as my sighted peers, but also just to generally indulge in this unparalleled form of escapism. As well as uh, being just an accessibility advocate, I also write uh, accessibility reviews for uh, hardware and mainstream games. Uh, partly this feedback is to send to those who might be interested in purchasing these products before they do so, so that they're aware of any accessibility issues I encounter during their use, uh, whether that's through like unboxings or whether that's through actual uh, usage and testing. But also I send this feedback to developers of these products so that hopefully, all being well, they can actually improve uh, during like the next iteration of that product. Now, uh, I will be using throughout the remainder of this talk the term Gamer Without Sight, or GWS. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, you're blind, aren't you? And the answer is yes, I am, that's correct but I prefer, uh, prefer not to use that label simply due to the fact that legal blindness can actually include uh, some residual and usable vision. So I therefore take uh, Gamer Without Sight to mean that uh, a person is playing video games and they cannot see at all whilst doing so. This isn't my first time actually being in the US as, as Tara has sort of briefly uh, referenced in uh, the introduction that she provided, uh, but the reasoning is I was able to travel for five weeks uh, in the previous year to, uh, as part of a Winston Churchill Travelling Fellowship provided to me by the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust or the WCMT. Now, what is a Winston Churchill Fellowship, you might be asking? Well, this uh, is an overseas grant, uh, well, no, a research grant rather, that allows you to travel overseas and bring your any findings that you take from your project back to the UK to hopefully positively impact uh, professions and communities therein. Uh, now that I knew uh, when I started this project that I was going to be focusing on game accessibility, so the, I realized that my findings would have far reaching and possibly a global impact rather than just a UK wide uh, reach. So, I entered my research with five questions in mind, namely as follows. Number one, are developers aware of accessibility? Number two, are developers willing to listen to the challenges faced by a GWS? Number three, does company infrastructure affect how implementation of accessibility features happens from studio to studio? Number four, what is the situation like across current platforms for GWS? And number five, where do I, when do I think the first fully accessible game will come out uh, in a AAA form with full in-game menu accessibility and gameplay? Uh, for the remainder of this, I'm going to discuss partly answering these questions, but uh, mostly this is done through the findings themselves. So uh, as part of my five-week tour uh, uh, crossing four states, I actually had the chance to not only conduct a number of uh, company visits, which I will discuss in a little more detail later on, but I also had the chance to attend E3, the uh, massive trade show that the industry uh, takes on every year, uh, where large numbers of products and games are revealed, but also uh, Microsoft's Gaming and Disability Bootcamp, which I believe Ian mentioned in the very first talk of the day, and also the uh, Xbox Fan Fest event which uh, Microsoft runs uh, alongside E3. Now, my reactions at the, ex uh, the Expo was pretty much a mixed bag, in a sense, because on the one hand, I had uh, interactions with companies who were very accommodating and approachable, and uh, one even hooked me up with a haptic chair that was uh, wired up to the trailers that were being exhibited, so that was an interesting experience. And uh, also, I had very interesting discussions about uh, game engine, uh, games, engines, and in the case of Crackdown, I was able to help solve an audio bug, or at least just find said bug, on the spot. Now, on the flip side, 
I was actually uh, unfortunate enough to encounter companies with inaccessible booths or booths staffed with individuals uh, who either didn't and didn't actually know anything about or seem to be interested in uh, accessibility. Expos are a valuable source of feedback. They're invaluable, in fact, in terms of feedback and building uh, positive relationships with your gaming public, including those with disabilities. Please be as welcoming as you can to individuals who come along to your conventions with disabilities, as it may be their first time interacting with not only your product, but your company as well. And first impressions can certainly go a long way in that regard. So slide six. With this, uh, in amongst the uh, expos and uh, other events I've just mentioned, came uh, a number of company visits. And uh, with that, uh, the reactions were positive as well, but also very enlightening. Uh, as much as I talked to a number of game studios, I also had conversations with Valve and NVIDIA, which were interesting on, on both ends from my perspective and from theirs. Uh, during these times, I actually got the chance to have my first fully fledged experience with VR, as well as uh, engaging in, well, Mortal Kombat, for want of a better pun of sorts, uh, against uh, members of the uh, development teams or just collaborators with said teams, uh, like uh, fighting against Osu 16-bit in uh, Injustice 2, as well as fighting against Ken Lobb, one of the guys who actually came up who was involved in the original Killer Instinct, but I fought against him in the reboot. Whilst conducting, yep, yeah, there's a picture there for those of you who can't see it, of me standing next to uh, a Spartan, uh, but it's actually a statue, but I'll come to that in a second. Because whilst I was visiting, I actually got the chance to go and see 343's Halo Museum, which is a very interesting place for those of you who get the opportunity to attend. Uh, but as a gamer without sight, I often get asked what I think video game characters look like. This isn't exactly the easiest of questions to answer, namely because the uh, quote unquote internal imaging process can take a large number of forms and work with a fair few sources. Uh, most of the source uh, material for these sort of internal images comes from the voice acting and sound design in the game, but it also comes from sometimes external media such as uh, books, and also action figures and uh, other elements of the franchise. Now, with that though, the, uh, the fact was clearly demonstrated to me that, you know, being able to stand toe to toe with a Spartan clad in full Mjolnir armor, as well as facing down the Covenant in the form of elites and brutes up close, I mean, yeah, they're just statues and costumes, but the point still stands. It gives a sense of scale and perspective that it's really hard to replicate, given that the internal images you have as a gamer without sight are almost certainly flawed in terms of, you know, their height to the player character, for instance. But this visit was able to demonstrate to me that accessibility doesn't just encompass most of what's been talked about today in that, you know, the features of the game you're playing. Accessibility reaches further out than that to external elements, so comic books, you know, uh, novelizations, animated media, and, you know, action figures and things. Uh, these positive uh, sort of inferences were carried forward to discussions I had with developers. And uh, again, as I stated earlier, most of the reactions I had were very, very positive from, from these company visits. Uh, some developers were surprised simply at the fact that not only a gamer without sight was playing their games, but doing relatively well but also that use cases that hadn't been considered before were coming up, such as use with a screen reader. So a screen reader, just to recap for those of you who aren't necessarily familiar with the term, is a piece of assistive tech that, put simply, uh, can relay on-screen elements such as buttons, controls, and just text in general when it's formatted in standards uh, through synthesized speech. But uh, other companies appreciated the opportunity to have in-person one-to-one interactions because, again, they highlighted use cases that hadn't necessarily been seen before and was able to reference issues that may have come up previously but not necessarily with the context of having a gamer without sight in, in the room to help solve issues. Now, speaking of problem solving, 
uh, there were companies who were able to solve issues on the spot with new and potentially effective solutions being theorized right then and there. Uh, above all though, it was very clear to me that once the companies had realized that accessibility was relatively easy to implement and certainly achievable, the reality had begun to dawn. So as you can see, there's a number of bullet points here. And these are in part some of the recommendations I came back with from my five week tour, which I then wrote up into my report. So contact, make it easy for those with accessibility concerns, regardless of a disability to contact you. Please do not copy and paste generic PR messages. That is a, a rather frustrating thing that I've seen. Uh, because what it can do is it can almost certainly turn gamers without sight off of watching your company for any future accessibility developments, regardless of how useful and large scale they might be. Use your accessibility features as a selling point. Now, uh, this has <laughs> slightly been covered with uh, things like Uncharted 4 and uh, I, I mean other games even where the passive fist could be said to be definitely covering the accessibility base by working with sort of uh, marketing of the difficulty level settings, etc. But, you know, if I see a product that says, you know, has accessibility features and what those specific features are, that sounds like a really interesting concept to look into. And the day I can buy a product without having to worry about what I sometimes term as the accessibility versus price problem, namely that sometimes you're not sure whether you can buy a game because it might not have the right accessibility features, then you know, the day I can buy a product without having to worry about that is a day where I will be more than happy to purchase more products from that company. Uh, publicize your accessibility features. Uh, well, publicity is the heading there. Publicize your accessibility features as soon as they are approved, even if that's massively before launch. Because then gamers without sight, like myself, can rest easy, relatively so, with the knowledge that their experience will be at launch marginally, if not greatly, uh, less painful uh, than it would have been otherwise without those accessibility features in place. Communication. If your accessibility features are being hampered in terms of their implementation uh, by either higher management, you know, higher authorities, uh, company infrastructure issues, or even just, I don't know, the engine you're working in, which can sometimes be an issue. Let consumers know what's going on because, you know, at the very least, they'll have sympathy for what you're going through. And sometimes they might even be able to suggest ways around it. And testing with the demographic. It's been highlighted earlier. Who better to test with than the people who are actually going to use your features? I mean, it's almost logic, really. If you've got a blind person, and you're adding in accessibility features for gamers without sight, get those players in and get them feeding back because sometimes they might find even easier ways, as Michelle was highlighting, they might find easier ways around what you're currently trying to do to say shorten verbosity of incoming text. So uh, more recommendations here. And yeah, more recommendations here starting with worldwide testing. Equally, as much as you are working with, you know, testing in-house in studios, and that might seem to be the easiest solution, you know, there are going to be testers like myself who are unable to actually come into your studios in the States and give you one-to-one -one feedback and put the time in, as it were, in terms of assistance. Now, you know, bring the builds to testers remotely. You know, it's not impossible might be tricky at times, but it's certainly not impossible to do. Because, you know, that feedback coming from a large range of use cases can be very useful. Speaking of uh, wider ranging things though, wider pre-release pre access as well. You know, you see all the YouTubers or the big sort of streamers and content creators flying out to these pre-launch events at various HQs. I can remember Battlefront 2 myself being a big thing where you had a large number of streamers covering even things that weren't in the uh, open beta, as far as I can remember. But, you know, it would be interesting to see accessibility features and the game in general marketed by streamers with disabilities. 
And simulation testing, flipping back briefly to the testing sphere of things, you know, it's been highlighted earlier as well. Even if you can get uh, what you might loosely term as subject matter experts in on the testing sort of cycle, what you also want to do is get uh, yourselves testing it because then you might actually find issues that you haven't found before. So for example, if you have a product, you can blindfold yourselves completely so you can't see anything. Try and unbox it from start to finish and uh, see if there's any parts where an unboxing process might be too complicated. Or if you have a game, you know, turn it onto a uh, competitive setting and see if there are any glaring audio cues that need to be put in or any you know, menu things that need to be revamped. But we'll come onto those aspects a little later. And the final one for this, uh, multiple resources. So even with uh, sort of narrated menus and accessibility features, uh, plain HTML files can be extremely useful before launch when they're released, especially given that you know sometimes you won't have the sighted assistance that's needed to get into the game, get into the right menus, and turn these accessibility features on on day one. So having that ability to do that without actually having any sighted assistance does ease the uh, stress and frustration of it all somewhat. So now. So now to the practicalities of this. So for years, there have been, there we go. For years, the main barrier to entry for gamers with outside into a brand new game, say they've just bought it, for example, is the menus. So, you know, navigating complex menu structures. Now, you know, this has mostly been facilitated for a very, very long time now by uh, written guides. So these guides are often compiled by gamers without sight who have attempted to play the game before, whether they've tried or failed uh, to manage actually getting anywhere. Now, uh, sometimes that's assisted by you know, sighted assistance. Other times that's assisted by trial and error. And uh, you know, these guides can often remain incomplete uh, to varying degrees of incompleteness, in fact due to the simple reason that you know, sometimes there are patches that change menu orders or you know, remove or add options as time goes on, or also a complete lack of sighted assistance to document all the processes that you actually need to work with to you know, get into the deeper layers of setting up specific scenarios. So you might have you know, how to get into a multiplayer lobby just on a basic level, but you might not have how to get into a custom private match with five people and yourself with a certain set of loadouts only permitted. I don't know. But, you know, that's the idea. But now, you know, there are options for resolving this issue. Uh, in recent years, a main piece of tech that's kind of come onto the uh, sort of assistance uh, field, if you will, is OCR or optical character recognition. Now, OCR. Uh, basically involves relaying, extrapolating text from an image and relaying it through to a screen reader, which, as I said earlier, is a piece of software that can synthesize this text into computerized speech. Now, OCR for console games often involves using an internet-connected app on a second screen, so a laptop or a desktop or, you know, sometimes even a phone that will be able to then read the screen for the user and relay the text. However, such apps can mo most certainly be impacted by performance issues, connectivity issues, operating systems, you know, device health, any number of factors that can make it extremely tedious. That and sometimes even fonts can get in the way. Um, you know, things like having having a clear and readable font can not just impact uh, those with visual, like sort of actual usable vision, but it can also impact gamers without sight using OCR. However, the landscape is certainly shifting and changing to accommodate uh, sort of new trends, if you will, in terms of the accessibility sphere. Last year, Microsoft announced at GDC that the same systems that were being used to underpin an eraser have been combined into part of the development kit. Uh, in a thing called the Microsoft Speech Synthesis API, or as I believe I termed it in my report, the MSSA. 
and this basically allows for spoken menus, so fully spoken menus and in-game UI elements as well. So things like, I don't know, health or, uh, you know, pause menus or just tutorial messages. But you also have, uh, as well as that, you have the Unity plugin mentioned earlier today, which can provide, you know, full accessibility to Unity games. And you also have the Tolk abstraction library, uh, which was used to retrofit Skullgirls into the PC accessible fighting game that it is now. Uh, and PC games can definitely make use of that library. Now, these tools all work uh, for interfaces. Now, if you're working with a game like, say, Hearthstone or Football Manager, then you're, you're going to theoretically at least be able to make these games relatively uh, almost fully accessible in a relatively short space of time. But that doesn't necessarily mean that all games are this easy to work with in terms of making them fully accessible to gamers without sight. Once you start involving complex mechanics, which we will come onto in a second, you know, that can then make things more difficult. But that doesn't necessarily mean accessibility can't be achieved. So, uh, FPS, uh, FPS games. So with, uh, once you get 2.5D going, so once you work with a 2.5D game, so a fighting game, for example, or a side scroller, that is in essence, relatively simple to work with in terms of, you know, stereo audio or proximity based cues, though not all games manage this, but that's, you know, on a, on a case by case basis normally. However, once you add in the relatively mysterious z-axis, or the third dimension, uh, developers often get kind of confused and uncertain as to how to implement these, uh, these more complex mechanics and particularly navigation of complex environments. Now, I've played a fair few uh, different shooters. I've played Overwatch, I've played Gears, I've played uh, a couple of iterations of Halo. Uh, but, you know, most of this play is facilitated by spatial audio cues, so where sound is coming from around me, and sometimes, you know, volume of sound and other cues, but also via the sighted assistance of others, whether this assistance comes from things like local co-pilot or cooperative systems that are locally uh, available, or whether that comes from online, uh, online services such as Xbox Live. So if I'm teaming up with uh, a number of people in Halo 5, I can either do that through the console itself locally, uh, maybe not in Halo 5's case, but I can do that uh, online as well, should I need to. So here's a clip of Copilot in action. Now Copilot, uh, I don't believe it's been explained at the moment, but for those who aren't aware, Copilot is a system integrated into the Xbox One operating system that allows for two, controller set, uh, two sets of controller inputs, rather, to be rendered as a single set of controller inputs. Now, actually, yeah, I think Ian uh, highlighted this earlier. Uh, the speci uh, specific combination of inputs doesn't necessarily matter as long as, as, long as you know, two controllers are being used as one. So in this next clip I'm about to show you from Doom 2016, I am taking control of the weapon side of things, so the... Uh, the firing and the changing of weapons where needed, uh, as well as possibly grenades as well. Uh, and my co-pilot is actually taking control of all of the navigational elements, so the jumping around, the looking, and the navigation generally. So here is a clip of Doom 2016. So as you can see, there's an audio cue to indicate we're in battle. And that's me firing the rifle there. This game does, in essence, become a wall of noise at points, so a co-pilot can be helpful, even in just navigating that. So as you can see, there's a fair amount of looking around going on and that's being facilitated by my co-pilot trying to find the enemies. That 
and there are cues for picking up power-ups as well. And then that guy makes his presence very well known by that audio cue. Yep, so that is uh, Copilot in Doom 2016. This works for other games as well, including this next one, but uh, this next one being Titanfall 2. But this clip actually comes from a slightly different scenario where instead of using a local uh, version of sighted assistance facilitated by Copilot, what ends up happening is myself and a fellow player uh, are actually online together in the game and working to actually uh, do what turns out to be my first Titan kill. And uh, yeah, for those of you who can't uh, see, this other player is actually Ian Hamilton. And this is through his POV. And you will see in a second. Ooh, that's, yeah, that's gotta hurt. <laughs> now, I've played a fair amount of uh, Halo and things uh, independently and really enjoyed it. But it's not necessarily just me who's uh, giving, you know, attempting to work with 3D mechanics. So you've, I'm aware of a, a Call of Duty player who has a visual impairment. I'm aware of a number of individuals who are playing uh, GTA 5 as well in first person view. Both of these cases are facilitated by not only the audio cues, but the assists available as well in their respective games. So uh, we're going to go through a few top tips here. So, yeah, so the first one, auditory and haptic cues uh, for enemies or objectives, objective proximity to crosshairs. So basically being able to line things up and pull the trigger, um, quite useful in those kinds of games. Uh, uh, yeah, aim center on walk or a button command, so auto center. For those of you who may have seen previous Halo games, if you run forward and your gun is not pointing in the center, uh, that will redirect your gun. Uh, Gears has it in, I think, for sprint. If you sprint, your gun will recenter itself. Um, and cues for nearby weapon pickups, uh, nearby weapons pickups, and locational objectives. So, if say I have to run to an area, pull a lever, and then move to a different area, then I should be able to make that happen fairly easily. Uh, aim and camera assist. So, essentially, making your bullets uh, more likely to hit the enemy and being able to lock onto the right direction to travel, and distinct cues for friendlies and enemies. So uh, being able to tell whether the footsteps or the gliding noises or whatever audio cues the, uh, the specific uh, character is using are friendly or enemy is quite useful. Uh, and a couple of things I, I failed to mention earlier, um, you know, run any, well, this, this applies to all the genre examples as well that I'm going to go through. Uh, run all your menus and uh, in-game messages through the text tools I mentioned earlier. And also as well, uh, menu navigation. So if you have uh, a cursor, like an analog cursor that you move over a menu item and then click it, uh, that should also be facilitated via D-pad specific commands as well. I can think of two recent examples, well, fairly recent examples, namely Destiny 2 and Assassin's Creed Origins, both of which failed to do this, which is very frustrating when you get into a game and you can't even move the menus around. That can be quite annoying. So we're going to move from this onto racing games. Now, for around a decade, and well, for over a decade and a half, racing games in audio-only circles have been present. So there's certainly a few lessons that can be learned from mainstream developers attempting to integrate various facets of accessibility into their own titles. Now, uh, whilst discussing uh, the concept of accessible racing games with various individuals connected with the Forza series in its various iterations, uh, I discussed a theoretical concept called the audio racing line. Now, this is a separate queue that uh, would uh, be separate from your car's audio and any other audio in the game. And it would move to indicate uh, which direction you need to go. 
So in essence, if it's in the center of your stereo field, you need to go straight ahead. And if it moves to your left or right, it can then, uh, you then follow your audio racing line cue to make the turns. Sounds fairly straightforward. And that's because the learning process then would be pretty much the same as a sighted player. So, you know, figuring out what speed you can take corners at without crashing into walls, uh, which is very easy to do regardless of how well you can see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but also, you know, having a time trial method, uh, having a time trial mode or a practice mode can also be of great help given that you want to try and get the best lap times you can. So we're going to go for a few top tips here as well. So uh, rally style turn indications. Uh, top speed three, which is a game I was uh, going to recommend on the previous slide. Top speed three was a game that is now no longer in active development, uh, created by a studio called Playing in the Dark. Uh, this is basically what I would consider to be the best quality place to start for an accessible racing game or for implementation of accessibility, given that this was an audio only racing game. Rally style turning indicators are actually pretty much present in Top Speed 3, uh, although they're nowhere near as complicated as what are called pace notes in actual rally driving. Um, audio cues and haptics too, of course, for distance from the racing line. So if you, you know, so the, if you run off the edge of the track, uh, you are immediately informed about it uh, via two sources instead of just one. Um, practice modes for cars and tracks, so you know that, uh, so you know what car, so how your car will sound on different surfaces, uh, and so that you know how to uh, navigate the tracks correctly. Uh, distinct audio cues for cars uh, you are or aren't controlling. So if you're say you're racing against one other person and they're and you're both using the same car so that you can tell which car is yours uh, and the ability to adjust ambience and music independently of the rest of the game uh, now that would be useful say so that you can even just hear the ui generally uh, or so that you know you you want to turn up maybe the ambience so you can know that it's raining for example or that you know it's it's snowing i don't know maybe you're racing in the snow or if it's just sunny, you'll just hear nothing, I suppose. Or just, yeah. <laughs> right, so fighting games. The genre that probably most of you who are aware of what, uh, my content creation uh, were probably expecting. Now, um, fighting games uh, are a relatively easy genre to work with in terms of accessibility. Uh, though Killer Instinct is still the game that I hold to very high regard, the reboot that is, given how much it does right compared to its current competitors. It has a very simple way of entering a 1v1 exhibition match and its lobby system isn't too bad either for multiple uh, multiplayer sort of uh, competitive tournaments, for example. Uh, it also has a, a relatively simple menu structure in general. Uh, but it also the, the main key point of Killer Instinct, or KI as it's sometimes known, is its very, very detailed audio design. Now, to put this in perspective, uh, KI has movement, a full range of movement cues for characters walking forwards and backwards, dashing forwards and backwards, uh, jumping forwards, backwards, and in neutral. Um, and the, the jumping aspect of it is quite important. Uh, especially as uh, when you leave the ground, from, well, from the moment you leave the ground pretty much uh, to when you come down, there is something going on in the audio uh, for your character. This is in comparison to Street Fighter V, where the only way you necessarily know when a player has jumped is halfway through when they're at the apex of the arc, which is slightly annoying when you're trying to anti-air a character. But uh, given that KI is such an audio heavy game, I think it's better that I just demonstrate how much it does uh, well in terms of providing information. Uh, what I'm going to use to demonstrate this is a clip from probably one of the hardest special boss fights I've had to face. And I think uh, those of you who know the game will know what I'm about to say next. Boss Shadow Jago. Uh, this input reading boss is very tricky to deal with, but this is a clip uh, that demonstrates uh, just how it works if you can't see anything at all.
outputting lots of energy. <laughs> I wonder what happened there. <laughs> so as you can see, there's near enough cues for pretty much everything. So there's even cues for when he activates his, his instinct mode. So even when I've come up uh, sort of guarding from his next attack, uh, the cues are there to indicate that I've managed it. As I said, read your inputs. And here, my execution fails me when I try to get the ultimate, even though I still won. Right, so that is, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So uh, yeah, and with that, we will go on to the top tips. So uh, as I said earlier, use te uh, if there is any text so say for instance you have a, i don't know a crafting menu in your in your fighting game which is not unheard of uh, killer instinct did do this for one of its modes which is why i reference it um, stereo separation uh, no matter uh, how close the characters are when they're fighting so that you can at least tell who's on the left or right that can be very uh, crucial unique cues for all important actions so if it has any significance to the player in terms of the outcome of a match, for example, give it a cue. Uh, cues for resources or health gauges, etc. So any, any important uh, UI elements that need cues, give those cues as well. But also give it an ability to be adjusted independently because you know, sometimes players might learn to fight with those cues off once they've played the game for long enough. And for character select, when you have a character highlighted, make it clear for player one and two which character they've highlighted before they have to lock it into place permanently. And also that extends to mirror matches as well. So if I'm playing as the same character as my opponent, make it clear which one, uh, which one of us has actually won the match. So yeah, we're going to go on to uh, just a few things. I mean, that was a couple of genre specific examples. But if you have any you know, uh, questions about projects that you guys are working on, please do come and uh, sort of ask me uh, and you know, ask other people as well, because there are likely things that can be done. And uh, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, it matters how much it replicates the experience of you know a sighted gamer but if it can't necessarily be done for completely logical reasons which will sort of be discussed as you know as time goes on then you know that can that can change elements of it but uh, with ki as well just to sort of say uh, highlight a thing that i should have highlighted before uh, i will be uh, taking on challenges next door with a rig setup so if you guys want to find out uh, whether I can play as effectively as a sighted player, then please feel free to come and... <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm happy to discuss any uh, questions that you guys may have about projects you're working on, even if they've already been covered in, in these genre, uh, genre specifics. I really hope this presentation has given you at least a little insight into how gaming with Outsight actually works in practice. But, you know, accessibility is achievable. This is the front line. Where do we go from here? The answer, we'll see. As Winston Churchill once said, Ah, this is not the end. Uh, it is not even the beginning of the end. Uh, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. 
And here's a bunch of links that you can feel free to take a uh, photo of should you need to read those later, including the reports uh, in which I wrote up uh, most of these findings in a far lengthier read than uh, has been presented here. So thank you very much for listening.